It's always important not just to learn what to do to become a Christian. It's obviously important to learn now what? What do you do afterwards? A person is not baptized, forgiven of their sins, as it say, washing away of their sins, without understanding there is a responsibility that goes with it. Even mentioned Brother Anderson's prayer tonight, talking about the responsibility we have now as Christians. Well, the book of 1 Peter is a very special book because it has to do with the true grace of God wherein you stand, 1 Peter 5 and verse 12. It says, I've written to you briefly, exhorting you that of the true grace of God wherein you stand. But back to chapter 1, verse 14, it says, As obedient children. So your child of God, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, lives and abides forever. So that's the seed the Father uses to beget children in an honest and good heart. So now being a child of God, what do you do? As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. As it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. A good preacher friend of mine one time said, and the more I think about it, the more I find it to be true. All of life, and particularly human life, is to be understood against the background of the character and the attributes of God. One cannot fully understand how to live one's own life without realizing that everything that one does is based upon a standard, then that standard is God himself. Jesus came into the world to show us the Father. He said that when the uh, apostles were basically asking the question, or Thomas asked the question, Philip you know, ask the question, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said, how long have I been with you? He that's seen me, seen the Father. So that was part of the work of Jesus, is to show not the image of the Father, as it were, the visible image of what does the Father look like while you're the Son. It is the attributes of the Father. And he did that. But particularly, is this true in the quality called holiness? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Follow peace and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. Now, no man will see the Lord does not mean you won't see God in the day of judgment. We're all going to see God in the day of judgment, righteous and unrighteous. But what he means by no man will see the Lord means he'll, he'll know, he will not be where the Lord is. Follow peace and holiness. Holiness. Even back under the Old Testament, you had various pictures of holiness. You had uh, the courtyard where the tent or the outer court, what was called, where you had the brazen altar. And then you had the laver, the laver sometimes it's pronounced, by which the priests were to wash the blood off the hands and their feet in particular. And then you had a place only priests could go. Now, an Israelite who was not uh, obviously a Levite or a priest, he could come into the courtyard, particular man, if he, he'd bring his sacrifice. At the temple, you had the court of women, the court of men, the court of the Gentiles. But what is that first room that the priest went in? It had the lampstand, it had the altar of incense, it had a table of showbread and the showbread on it. What's that called? Holy place, correct? Then there was a veil that separated between the holy place and Holy of Holies. What's in the Holy of Holies? That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the high priest went in one time a year and took that blood, sprinkled upon the mercy seat to make atonement for the people. And in turn then, that typified, according to the book of Hebrews, the fact that one died and entered in one time, as it were, into heaven. And therefore, remember when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the actual veil in the temple? Rent from top to bottom. So what happens? By the way, that was about the uh, ninth hour of the day, or we'd say about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That would have been around the time of the evening sacrifice. When I get to heaven, or particularly around that time of the judgment day, I would like to have asked the priest who was burning the incense on that altar, what went through your mind? when you saw the, the veil rent from top to bottom because he was in there at the evening sacrifice when Jesus said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He was in there, he saw that. It's not just in the record. 
Well, the very fact that you could see into the Holy of Holies from the holy place, that's a shocker. On top of the fact that you see this rent from top to bottom and no man did it. Nobody's in there for to do that. That's a shocker. Across the top of the high priest, when he had on the full high priest dress, on the mitre was a plate engraved on that plate, holiness to the Lord. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. All the way through the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, this concept of holiness. Well, what does that really mean? Be ye holy, for I am holy. As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But, as he would just call you as holy, so be you holy. Well, I can't be in every attribute like God. I'm not omnipresent, obviously. You know, I'm not omniscient or all of those omni qualities. But there are some qualities about God the Bible teaches me I am to have like the love of God, the mercy of God, so forth. Holy living. I want to again illustrate this to help young folks understand that. Again, as I say, you older folks will pick it up. But holiness carries with it several qualities. Number one, it involves purity. It's tied into that word sanctify, to be sanctified. It carries with the idea of to clean up. Number two, there is a priority. Here's a person who has been cleaned up, and now they've been set apart. There's a priority here. I'm now placed in this category because I was at one time in this category. And then number three is there is now a place of application by which to be useful. But we start with purity. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it talks about that we are sanctified. Sanctified. Can you come down to chapter 1 and verse 22? It says, seeing then you have purified your soul in obeying the truth of the spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, so that you love one another pure heart fervently. You see, then you've purified your soul. Well, what about 1 John 3 and verse 3? Be ye pure even as he is pure. And over and over and over in the Bible, there's this idea of being pure, washed, something washed away, being made clean. You know, even in the Old Testament, you had what was called clean and unclean. By the way, aren't you glad you live under the new and not the old? If you just visited a cemetery before you came here tonight, you'd have been unclean. To be in contact with a dead body made one unclean. Now you think about that. And there's a lot of qualities you read in the Old Testament. It's almost like, how did a person ever think he was ever going to maintain that kind of absolute perfection? Well, Jesus did. Okay. Purity. Clean. Turn to the book of Ephesians for just a second. Notice this particular concept. In chapter 5, he's talking about husband and wife relationship, particularly as it relates to Christ and the church. Now, can you imagine a bride on her wedding day? I did a wedding not just a couple of weeks ago. You imagine that bride says, oh, I put on that fine, clean, nice wedding dress that probably won't wear but one time in my life, put it in mothballs for somebody else, maybe one day a daughter or whatever to marry and she says, you know, I believe I'll go out here and play a little volleyball while I'm uh, waiting on this, this wedding procession. Or, uh, by the way, you know, we have mud volleyball games up in North Alabama for uh, sort of what they call fundraisers. You imagine a woman putting on her wedding gown, as spotless as that is, say, well, I'll just get out there. And then, by the way, you know, I'm not the outside, I'm the inside. Okay? And then she's just going to walk down the aisle, and here's the groom, here's her husband looking at that. I said, hey, bud, what you see is what you get, okay? And this is what, this is what you got, okay? Hey, you going to say for better, for worse? I don't know what that is, but you'll figure it out, all right? What is it? As a bride adorned for her husband, Revelation 21 says the church is. They saw that heaven and Jerusalem come down. As a bride adorned for her husband. 
Look at this statement in Ephesians 5. It says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify. Sanctify. That's the idea of holy, to make holy. Okay? And cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Well, that has reference to baptism. Okay? Those that understood the Old Testament concepts understood that when that priest was going first to put on his priestly garments, there's two things he had to do before he could ever put those garments on. Number one, he had to take, if he had on, his common clothes. He'd take those off. Then he had to take a bath. Then he had to wash. Then he put on the priestly garments. Over in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Watch this. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have what? Put on Christ. Baptized first. In the process now, put on. There wasn't a person who was a priest didn't understand that concept. Under the law, wash, put on. Wash, put on. They couldn't function as a priest until they first washed and put on. You didn't offer, you know, in your common clothes. Now think about that. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. What's that? That's putting on Christ. Same concepts. Well, when do you start putting on? After you've cleaned up. After you cleaned up. Think about this in denominational concept. How many in the denominational world believe you've put on Christ before you ever get in the water? It's taught right and left where they realize the, the uh, point of reference here. You know, the idea, here's a person who is saved by the process of faith, okay? And, they, and they've become a Christian, and they are God's child, and all of what goes with being a God child, and now we're going to wash. That's like a man having put on his priestly garments, and now he's going, well, wait a minute. That's not how you do it. What you do is, you wash, then you put on your priestly garments. Now you can function as a priest. That is the concept of Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That's the concept. Okay? Just as they knew under the law. Well, purify, clean, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Literally, you heard the word, those Ephesians heard that word. When they learned what to do to become a Christian, they got in contact with the water. And ever since that point, now they're saints, they are sanctified, they're now ready to serve God based upon the fact that they learned the teaching of the New Testament, teaching them to observe all things which are I've commanded you, Matthew 28, 20. But now let's go to the second concept. Second concept is not just the matter of the cleansing, now there is the priority of being put in order to be used. Um, all the way through the Bible, there is the continual picture painted you are no longer your own you are no longer your own it's in the word redemption the word redeem carries with the idea of a little bit different picture from sanctification though the the uh, result is the same redemption means you are owned by someone else or taken captive by someone else and through a ransom price whatever that ransom price may be, with God it's the blood of his son, with a ransom price, you are now set free from this in order now not to be set free to, hey, I'm free, I can do whatever. Now to do of the person who set you free. While over here you might be a slave to sin, guess what? You're still a slave. No, you're not to whom you say, yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. With the sin and the death of obedience and righteousness. Still a slave. A servant. One who now belongs to another. And in belonging to another, now that you've been set free, this is your responsibility. This is your priority. Now let me illustrate it this way with an illustration of Brother Gus Nichols. Years ago, a... Uh, I guess you say a protege of Brother Gus Nichols, his name was Glenn Posey, Glenn's still alive by the way, told me an account of one time he was in a gospel meeting. 
And uh, Brother Nichols came to the meeting. Brother Glenn was doing the meeting, like I'm conducting this service. Matter of fact, Glenn said it made him extremely nervous to have Brother Gus Nichols out. He said, matter of fact, I knew Brother Nichols knew my sermon better than I knew and had studied it. But he didn't come to do the meeting. He came to hear me preach in the meeting and to be a part of the meeting and psalm service and so forth. Well, he said Brother Nichols just sat right on the edge of his seat the whole time. So he could have quoted those verses better than I could. As a matter of fact, he could have quoted the verse before and after the one I did quote. He said, Brother Nichols just sat on the edge of his seat. He said, when it was all over, got to the back. Brother Nichols generally is about one of the last ones that goes out because he's greeting everybody else in the auditorium as he's going out the back door too. And uh, made the statement, says, Brother Nichols, you knew the topic that I was preaching on tonight probably better than anybody in this room. I've heard you preach even on the subject like this. Why did you, of all people, sit, as it were, on the edge of your seat listening to what I had to say? Here's what Brother Nichols said. He said, years ago, I met this girl, and I became attracted to her and fell in love with her, and I married her. And I hadn't been the same since. He says, about that same time, I met my Lord, heard about my Lord, fell in love with my Lord, and I married my Lord, and I obeyed the gospel, and I ain't been the same since. Y'all get that, right? It don't make any difference who's holding the meeting. It don't make any difference who's preaching in this pulpit or any other. I'm going. Why? Because I didn't go to listen to some man. I went to hear about my Lord. That's what it's about. You see, I've been cleaned up. I've been made pure. And I've got a priority that I've set. And my priority is now, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. Whether I get anything, whether I get what Job got. By the way, that would be the middle part of the book, not the first and the last. If I got the sufferings and the trials, I'd still serve God because he's God. So there is a, there's a picture here in sanctification. Here, I've been clean. Now I'm set apart. Now there's a priority by which to live, which now becomes to part three, which is where the, sort of where the rubber meets the road. Now comes the practice of what I said I'm going to do. You know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to make a commitment. I want to straighten my life out. I want things to be so-so now, and, and I'm going to commit to that. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to do that. Entirely different. When I get over to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 12, and Paul's trying to get Timothy to understand, now, look, I'm suffering these things. I'm going to lose my life over these things, this cause of Christ. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Chapter 1, verse 8. When he comes to verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Why? I know whom I have believed and persuaded he is able to keep, keep what? Keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Did God commit his all to me? Yes. How do I know that? Read that in the Bible, what he did with his son. Committed his all to me because of my sinfulness. Then pray tell me what is my reasonable service? What am I to do with my physical body? Well, I read about it in Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, there's our word, right? Holy, acceptable unto God. What is that? That's your reasonable service. Literally, the Greek word is logia. It means logical. It's only logical that if he gave for, to me what there's no way I could ever repay, what can I do? That's the question. It's not what I have to do. That's not what a Christian asks. Do I have to go to church? No. Do I have to read my Bible? No. Do I have to pray? No. Oh, hey, 
you're my preacher. I've been waiting on a preacher to tell me that. I didn't say you had to do anything. I'm saying, what do you want to do? Because let me tell you something. You're going to do what you want to do. We all do what we want to do. Now, why would I choose this kind of life? Why would I suffer for my faith? By the way, I've been persecuted before because I'm a Christian. In America. In high school. In the state of Georgia. I won't tell you all those horror stories. I, I was raised in a Christian family, but folks, this isn't a Christian world we're living in. That's an unholy world. That is an immoral world. And if I'm going to do what the word holiness means, I've got to understand what that concept's all about. I've got to understand. I did not pray, Father, that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the wicked one. That's what John said. That's what Jesus prayed about the apostles. I'm going to you. I know what my work is, and I know I'm going to leave. I'm not saying that you take them out of this world. I know you need them in this world. By the way, what would happen if the apostles had left with Jesus? Where would we be? By the way, you wouldn't have the book of Acts, would you? Because that's the Acts of the Apostles. Okay? Well, well, what's the point is? I've got to live in this world. But I don't have to live like it. Amen. Nowhere close to it. Let me sort of drive a peg down here. We're still talking about the same concept of holiness, sanctification. Um, sometimes young people talk to me about some of these strange things they wear and say and some of the things they do because they won't be different. Say, I won't be me. I won't be unique. Let me explain something to you, young folk. You want to be different. You want to stand out. And stand out in a good way. Just live the Christian life. Amen. Here's a person over here who said, let me show you this tattoo. I've seen 15 of that same model on kids out here on the streets. No, you haven't seen one like this. Pretty close. If I squinted, they'd all look alike. Okay? Rainbow hair. Saw that in the airport one time. That didn't make you different. Makes you just like them. That's what it makes you. Black fingernail polish, toe, toenail polish, black eyes look like a raccoon. Makes you look like what I've seen on TV. It's called goth. It's called goth. See, I, see I'm different. No, you're not different. No, you're not. You conforming to what's out there. My generation, baby boomer generation, we're so smart, we got it all figured out. My generation back in the 60s said, try it, you'll like it. Try it, you'll like it. LSD, marijuana, heroin, amphetamines, barbiturates, try it, you'll like it. My generation did. A lot of them didn't live half their days. Get me on the alcohol. Party. Party till you die. That's what they did. That's what they did. You won't be different. You live the Christian life. You be different. As a matter of fact, you can look at yourself in the mirror every morning and be glad of what you're looking at. That's a fact. You don't have to be embarrassed to look in that mirror and realize I stood up for my values by saying no to this and that like say no to drugs y'all remember that slogan just say no well the, the folks that got that slogan up is my generation that used to say try it you'll like it see we got a little bit smart those of us that still lived through that whole generational thing because we realized these folks that went on that bandwagon the wagon crashed, folks, and they were on it. They died. And there's people still wanting to fly that flag, go down that road. Look, I can't stop you. But there's warning signs that go down that road. Just the idea of drugs. I've, I had to counsel kids who got hooked on that stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. Their parents go through torment almost literally 
It eats them up inside and out. And there's a little word over in Galatians 5. King James and the works of the flesh, it's the word witchcraft. Witchcraft. Anybody in here want to practice witchcraft? And all of what goes on. I got a book in my library, Drawing Down the Moons, the title of the book. Teaches you how to be a warlock. Somebody gave me that book. Don't know why they wanted to give me that book. Thought I might want to study the occult. But I read some of the chapters on that. There's some weird people in this world. Particularly the one that wrote that book. <laughs> Witchcraft. Nobody in, nobody in sophisticated 21st century America is going to follow that. The Greek word is pharmacia. You hear an English word in that? If you just transliterated what's translated witchcraft in the King James Version, it would be the word pharmacy. The use of drugs in an illegal or recreational way. That's what witchcraft's calling card was. That's what it was. By the way, the rock and roll culture, before you got off into some of these other weird genres, do you know how they would get high to get in tune with the muses? By the way, that's the gods of music, the muses, by which then you could come to write these lyrics that you're mad at the world about. They get high on alcohol and drugs. It's like an out-of-body experience, and this is how I can write it. Elton John, you ever heard of the song Rocket Man? There's a line in that song. Here's what it says, and I'm going to be high as a kite by then. I heard him in an interview say, and that's exactly what I was when I wrote those lyrics. Y'all get that, right? By the way, what kind of holy lifestyle does he live in? It's real popular or gaining some traction. Not with me, it's not. Holiness. I was in a gospel meeting at the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee, about a year ago. A year ago last spring. The next to the last night of the gospel meeting, a man, as soon as the service is over, comes up to me. He says, Brother Clark, I don't know what you're preaching tomorrow night, the last service of this meeting, but I'm going to tell you what you got to preach before you quit this meeting. Now, let me tell you something, guys. That'll get your attention, right? That'll perk your ears up. All right, I'm all ears. What is it? He said, we've got a teenage girl here who made the statement out loud that she has a gay friend, and she thinks that's cool. And you've got to preach on that topic before you close this meeting now. Well, I'll assure you that was not my subject to discuss that I had planned to preach on the Wednesday night of that gospel meeting. But what I preached on is holy living. That's what I preached on. And in the whole process of preaching on holy living, I touched on that aspect without ever referencing what that man told me. When that service was over, the local preacher there, his name is Paul Sain, Paul came up to me and says, I'm glad you said something. I've been having to work on two sermons that I've got to deliver right here from that same pulpit on that same subject. And I'm glad you approached it before I ever got in the pulpit to deal with it. Let me tell you, young folks, something. If you had told me when I first started preaching over 35 years ago that I would have to get in a pulpit of Churches of Christ and teach our people that homosexuality is not anywhere close to being pleasing to God or in the ballpark of living a holy life, I told you you was crazy. Our folks aren't going to fall for that. And I'm here to tell you I was wrong. It's out there. And I'm not pointing in this auditorium of this church but it's in our brotherhood. For a long time, some folks just sort of keep it in the closet. Folks, they've kicked the closet doors wide open. And they're not ashamed of it. 
As a matter of fact, a little bit of this push is you discriminate like a man's skin color or like a person's gender over here. You discriminate. You start speaking against that. Well, I guess I got a jail cell somewhere waiting on me. Because I'm going to tell you something. I read that right there. It's crystal clear what Romans 1 says about it. And God destroyed two particular well-known cities in those days with fire and brimstone because of that alternative lifestyle. And Second Peter in the book of Jude says they were examples of the vengeance of God on unrighteousness. That was for our example. That's why it's recorded here. It's for our example. That's what God thinks about. No, that's what your God thinks about it. Let me tell you something. The only God there is is the God in this book. Amen. And you may not want to believe that, but this is the only real God there is. And that real God says, Holy, be ye holy, for I am holy. God didn't make man and man in the beginning. He didn't make female and female in the beginning. By the way, could he have? Sure he could have. There's some of his animal creation that, um, I mean, they can reproduce, you know, what's called asexually. God could have made it any way he wanted to. God made a male and female. By the way, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 19 to verify what Moses wrote was accurate. That's history. That's not mythology like the first 11 chapters. If, if Jesus believed the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis was mythology, then why did he quote it in Matthew 19? He didn't think what God did in the Garden of Eden was mythology. He quotes it as fact. From the beginning, it was not so. You ever run into someone that said, well, God made me this way. That's the way it's being argued now. Just like God made him Hispanic or black or Asian or Caucasian. Or, God made them that way. So God made me the way I am. Well, they've done studies on twins. You know, identical twins. That here all of a sudden, here's one that came from the same womb, same genetic code as it were. Here's another one came from the same womb, identical twins. How is it that one, if God made that way, one ends up going down that road and the other one says, that's abomination to me. Folks, they came from the same genetic material. Y'all young folks got that, right? If it's true, why do twins not follow the same course? Why? Well, it's because it isn't. It's a choice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says, Abusers of themselves with mankind, in verse 10. No, you're not the unrighteous, you're not inherit the kingdom of God. Abusers of themselves with mankind. What is that? That's the very nature of homosexuality. As a matter of fact, some translations put it that way. Neither homosexual or, you know, feminine, because it goes down the line. Why would God then, if God made you that way, then turn around and condemn you for doing what I made you? But well, see, here's what it's all about. I like it. I want it. I'm going to have it. And what you're going to do is you're going to let me have it. And really, that's not really my agenda. What my real agenda is, is not only you're going to let me have it, what we're going to do is we're going to revolutionize the world. And we're going to make it the norm. That's what the agenda is, guys. I saw that with the feminist movement. The feminist movement basically says, you know, equal work, equal pay. Who's against that? Who in their right mind would be against that? And yet the idea is what? We don't want just this. We want this. And we want this. And then it moves into religion, and now we want the pulpit. Now we want the eldership. See, we want what you got. Well, by the way, if I could, ladies, I'd let you have it. 
Now, some of you understood what I meant by that. Let me tell you something. You want this kind of heat? You want this kind of stress? Hey, ladies, come get it. i let you have it. Ma'am, you don't want it. You don't want it. And I believe God understood in the dispositions he put between men and women. I believe God knew in the dispositions he put in men what it took to be able to do that kind of work. I sat down with my sister, who's obviously female, and I said, I'll never be a woman, you'll never be a man. Now, I can tell you the perspective of a man, but I can never tell you the perspective of a woman. I said, let me ask you a question. Of all this emphasis of roles, men and women roles, in the fact that you are female, with all the chemicals God put in you to be a female, what is your experience, not just your Bible knowledge, what is your experience of the very nature of wanting to take the lead over men? She says, of my understanding, that's something I would not want. I am much more comfortable as a woman being in the support role of the ones who are taking the lead. And then here's her statement. I've worked, for, and by the way, don't you women crucify me for that. She said, I've worked for enough women as bosses to tell you, you ain't seen drama. You ain't seen drama until here is a woman having to work for another woman. Any of you folks in here know what she's talking about? Oh, now I'm sexist. I've already gotten off on it, right? She says, there's, lo there's a lot more over here of what you'll find between here. Let the man have the role. By the way, that's what God designed it. Now, I'm not saying they're not great Bible teachers who are female. By the way, a lot of my great Sunday school teachers were women. By the way, my mama was a woman, okay? And my daddy gone in a lot of gospel meetings. Guess who taught me a whole lot about the Bible at home? It wasn't my daddy. It was my mother. So don't tell me women don't have Bible knowledge. But let me tell you something. Every godly, holy woman I know won't get in this pulpit and do like what I'm doing. You know why? Because they know this book. They know 1 Timothy 2. They know 1 Corinthians 14. They know where their role is, and that's what they're going to fulfill because that's what they want to fulfill. That's called holiness. You see, we're not talking about just morality of life. That goes without saying, right? Holiness is living this distinctive role according to what God's pattern and design is and being content with it. Now, let me lose this, let, close this lesson out, this illustration. Several years ago, I was trying to impress upon kids at camp, Bible camp, this concept of holiness. By the way, you've got a religious group out here that call themselves holiness, correct? Charismatic persuasion. And a lot of people want to know, what in the world does that mean? By the way, they way beyond snake handling. And they may have a little pocket of it up in northeast Alabama up in that area. It's all, I saw a record in Yahoo not long ago. Somebody got bit by a snake and died. Of course, their concept is didn't have enough faith. Or take this question, take this concept. The Lord just wanted to take him home. Never figured that one out. You talk about, you know, if they drink any deadly thing, you know, snakes, deadly serpent bite them, do them no harm, but the Lord wanted to take him home. That's why he died. He's trying to impress upon his young people at camp. So I took two white styrofoam cups. And by the way, Dr. Pepper is real ucky, yucky, and sticky if you leave residue in the bottom of a cup, particularly white styrofoam, and you can see it without a, micro without a microscope. So I drank some Dr. Pepper out of both of those cups. Okay? I took those two cups to camp, speaking to these kids, and uh, as I was about to start, I walked up to a girl that I knew sitting in the front row. I walked up with these two cups, and I pointed them to where she could see the insides. I said, I'm going to give you one of these cups. Which one do you want? And she picked one of them, and I let her have it. Of course, the one she didn't pick was the one that had the residue in the bottom of it, because she could tell that it had been drunk out of. 
And I'll tell you the rest of the story on the cups she picked in just a minute. <clears throat> well, I said, good choice when she picked that one. I walked back and I held the dirty cup up. I said, uh, guys and girls, why, why do you think she wouldn't pick this? All, and one little, of course, one little bitty kid says, it's dirty. It's dirty. I said, that's right. I drank out of this cup. Oh, you drank out of that. That's why she didn't pick that. I said, well, let me explain something. I drank out of the one she's got, too. She just don't know it. It's pretty obvious somebody drank out of this one or poured something in there, poured it out, and left the, left the residue in body. But I drank Dr. Pepper out of that one, too. And I sanctified that cup. Both of those cups at one time were dirty. Both of them had been used. But one of them had been cleaned up. Been set aside to be used again. I said, I said all that to say this. That's what we all are. At one time, we were all dirty. Isn't that right? Washed in the blood of the Lamb. We were all dirty. Nobody was a spotless, mint clean cup, straight out of the package, ready to go. One time, we were all stained. But now you're sanctified. Now you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. Can you imagine having sit in a sit beside someone in a pew who is an adulterer, fornicator, idolater, effeminate, abuses himself with kind, mankind, thief, covetous, liar, extortioner? But you were washed, Paul said. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 down to 11. You were washed. You were sanctified, justified, spirit, in the name of the Lord, spirit of our God. You used to be that. Let me tell you something about homosexuals. I'm not against them. I'm against their lifestyle. I'm against them. I'm not against, against drunks. I'm against their lifestyle. I'm not even against adulterers. I'm against their lifestyle. I love the sinner. I hate the sin. This isn't discrimination, folks. We don't discriminate against people, but we are going to be distinctive about the sin. Holiness. Clean up, ready to be used. I'm going to use one last verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning of verse 21. When the, or verse 20, when the Apostle Paul is illustrating to Timothy, young man, about nevertheless the foundation of God stand sure having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 19. Now watch verse 20. But in a great house are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, these dishonorable things, if a man therefore purge himself, clean himself of these things, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use. What's the point of being baptized in water is the last condition by which to become a Christian. What's the point? Now the Lord can use you. What's the point of a person being restored to their first love? Now, the Lord can use you. I don't know about you, but I have trouble with this concept. Here's a man, particularly a man. It doesn't have to be a man, but in this case, it fits the illustration. Here's a man who's been what we call out of step with the church for years. Last Sunday, I was preaching at home and a man walked up to me and said, I have been out of the church for 50 years. I'm like, man, how old are you is what I wanted to ask him. Out of the church for 50 years. And he showed up with his granddaughter at Bethel last Sunday. I hope he was there today. Lord willing, I hope to see him Sunday back. How do you stay out of the church for 50 years? 
What in the world have you done with your life? By the way, what have you done with your contribution for 50 years? He obviously was giving that to the Lord, right? No, folks, he's giving it to himself. He's spending it on whatever he wanted. All right, to start coming back to services, you generally start on the back row, not point any of you folks in the back, all right? Brother French is against the back back. He's about as back as you can get, okay? Start in the back row. Next thing, start working up to where they maybe used to sit. Someone says, well, to keep them coming, can you put him down to serve on the table? No one out there right mind in our brotherhood would ever make that argument, except at Bethel. And I say, no way. No way. By the way, this is long before I was ever appointed an elder there. How do you take a man in a leadership role, he's standing up in a leadership position while it may be silent, how do you take a man that needs to be restored and put him leading a congregation? Folks, he's not fit yet for the master's use. Oh, come on. Well, let's put him in the Lord's hand. Let him head the table. Let him lead singing. Let him preach. We're not going to be respecter of persons, right? Let him have the whole shooting match one Sunday. I did that one time in a congregation in Georgia. I and one other adult man were the only only males in the whole, whole place on that Sunday. When I pulled up, he met me at the door. He says, I'll help you wait on the table and I'll lead closing prayer. You're going to do the rest. <laughs> That's what he told me. And I want you to think about this concept. From the time the service started to the time the service stopped, I never sat down. Think about that a minute. Because I didn't. When the service started, I started it, and you still stood up for the closing prayer. I never sat down the whole time. It's fine with me. Come on, brother. Now that you're starting to come back to church, we'll just plug you in. By the way, you're in the bulletin. That'll automatically force you, conscience-wise, to show up again. Let me tell you something, folks. That won't work with my wife if I were to be gone four or five years. And walk right in. Hey, honey, I'm home. What's for supper? <laughs> Let me tell you something. There'd be a few questions she'd be asking me. As a matter of fact, I might not see her for four or five days. And then after that fifth day, I might see a little bit out of that right eye. <laughs> Y'all get that? That don't work on the workplace, does it, guys? Well, I'm just going to take a sabbatical at my choosing. And by the way, you pull that stunt in the military. Y'all know what A-W-O-L means? Oh, come on now. Come on. Let me tell you something. If the world understands the concept of unfaithful, why can't we? Why can't we? Let me tell you something, folks. We need you back in step. We need you back meet for the master's use. But you gotta be cleaned up. You've gone back to the pig pen. The sows washed or wallowing in the mire. Gone back into the filth of the world. The pollution of the world, 2 Peter chapter 2 calls it. Be sanctified again. Blood cleanses. Cleanses by being baptized into Christ, meeting those other conditions. And the blood will cleanse you. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Read that in the book somewhere. 1 John 1, 9 is where I read it. And now, you set aside. And God can use a life like that. That's what holiness is. That's what it is. You're different. You're not different to thump your chest. You're different to serve. Don't you want to be used by God? He made you to serve Him. And that's the happiest life ever. Chad's going to lead us in the song, Selected. If you're subject tonight, need to be baptized to Christ, need to come home. Won't you be sanctified while together we stand and sing? <laughs>